Hi, everyone. Welcome to Audubon Society of Central Arkansas's monthly meeting. I'm Vice President Dan Scheiman. And uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, my colleague and coworker, Dr. Eric Johnson, who is Director of Conservation Science for Audubon Delta, which, of course, is a regional office of National Audubon that covers three states, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas. And with Audubon, he manages several research projects and provides science support for conservation implementation in our three state region. He earned his master's and PhD degrees from Louisiana State University studying conservation biology and wildlife management. Eric is also an, uh, active in Louisiana's birding community. He serves as Louisiana's Christmas Bird Count Regional Editor. He's a member of Louisiana's Bird Records Committee. He's the director of the Louisiana Bird Observatory, and he's a board member with the Acadiana Native Plant Project. He lives in Sunset, Louisiana, but right now he is broadcasting from his parents' place in New Hampshire. And he's gonna be talking about one of his favorite birds, the Prothonotary Warbler. Take it away, Eric. Absolutely, thanks, Dan. Uh, good to see you all. Have a, uh, hope you're having a good evening. Thanks for joining me. Um, any chance I have to talk about prothonotaries, I'll jump on it in a moment's notice. So this is, this is always fun. Um, let me go ahead and, and share my screen here. Uh, I gotta do this in sequence, bear with me. Um, And you should see my screen now, huh? Full screen, great. Yep. Good, yeah, so the title of my talk, I'm, I'm calling a renewed hope for the swamp candle. So swamp candle is a prothonotary warbler. They're also sometimes known as yellow pops or swamp warblers or the sweet, sweet, sweet bird. Um, lots of great nicknames because it's really hard to say prothonotary warbler. Um, but this is uh, the star of our show. It's, it's uh, Latin name is prothonotarius, a tree. It's the only member of its genus in the warbler family, and it is only one of two warblers that nests in cavities. Um, the other one, for those of you who like to do bird trivia, I'll give you a second to think about it. You can type it in the chat if you want. I'll come back to it in a second. Um, but what a second, secondary cavity nester means is that it is uh, it uses either the dugout cavities that primary cavity nesters like woodpeckers or chickadees might build, or it'll use a hollowed out um, crook in a log or a stump um, or an old rotten tree. And so let's see, did anybody put in the guess? No, no one's put in a guess for the other cavity nesting bird, uh, other cavity nesting warbler. Dan probably knows it. I know, but it's, I'm blanking on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I put you on the spot. Oh, uh, it's not black and white. It's actually a Western one. So it's probably not on most people's radar. So Lucy's warbler, they're also cavity nesters, so. Um, so they start arriving on the Gulf Coast as early as, as mid to late February, uh, late March, um, and they continue to arrive through early to mid April. Uh, they will lay three to six eggs in their clutch. Uh, the incubation is only done by the female. That lasts about 12 to 14 days once the last egg is laid. So they lay one egg a day until the clutch is complete, and then they begin incubating for about two weeks. And then once the eggs hatch, they all pretty much hatch synchronously within the 24 hours of each other. And then it takes those babies 10 to 11 days to fledge the nest, uh, to begin flying, and they just, they never go back. The parents will continue to, to take care of the, the feeding of those birds for up to 35 days. And um, prothonotary warblers can do this up to three times per season. Um, so we've now documented both in Arkansas, uh, Thombovis at Arkansas State University, and in Louisiana, we've documented that they will actually brood, individual birds will brood three times a year. Um, as far north as Ohio, where they breed, they will only brood one time per, per season. So there's a big difference uh, latitudinally, but um, they build a very uh, predictable nest. They often begin with... Uh, this moss that they collect from the sides of trunks from, you know, from deep within the swamps. They use that as a layer. And then uh, the male will actually prospect and, and build two, three, four, five of those 
to get a nest started and then the female will come around with them and they will ultimately choose together the nesting site and they finish off their nest with uh, usually the, the old needles of, of cypress leaves uh, that become the, the cup, the lining of their, of their nest. And um, within that, they lay their eggs, raise their young. And uh, as you can see, one of their favorite nesting platforms is a, is a Tupperware box. They will nest in almost anything you'll put out for them, an old coconut, an old shoe. Uh, they'll nest in grills, they'll nest in a, um, a golf cart, uh, you know, they're, they're not too picky. It seems like they're, they're often nest uh, site limited. And so they will take advantage of almost anything you put out for them. And uh, so one of the things we do is we put out nest boxes and I'll get into that in a little bit. So where I have mostly worked on this bird is in Louisiana. Um, Louisiana is a really important place for this species. And of course that habitat extends up the Delta uh, um, through Eastern Arkansas. Um, and so we, you know, have estimated, this is eBird data, that something like 21% of the entire world's population nests within the swamps of Louisiana. Um, so one fifth of all the birds are in Louisiana. And if you, if you account for the entire lower Mississippi alluvial valley, um, it's, it's greater than 50% of the world population um, along the Mississippi Valley. So uh, we have a tremendous amount of responsibility for this bird. Um, and as many of you know, migratory birds in particular are experiencing long-term steep declines. Uh, we have lost something like 2.5 billion migratory birds over the last 50 years. Uh, the species that are most at risk are those that migrate very long distances, um, including those that, are, uh, that nest within grasslands, birds that use uh, um, uh, winter areas in the, along the coast, and birds that winter in South America. So again, those long distance migrants, and we'll put prothonotary warbler in that last category there. Um, and so this is the specific trend of prothonotary warblers over the last 50 years. These are data that were, that were generated using the breeding bird survey um, that USGS or organizes and manages every year. Um, if you participate in the breeding bird survey, you're contributing to our understanding of how bird populations are changing um, over, over the last half century. And so prothonotaries have disappeared by about 30% or so over the last 50 years. It actually looks like their population has stabilized to some degree over the last decade or so. And yeah, this graph is a little bit out of date, but it's it, the, the trend is still about the same. Um, one of the things that we've noticed when we started to dig into this is that that disappearance of, of prothonotary warblers is actually outpaced the loss of their bottomland forest habitat that they breed in. So they're disappearing from these forests faster than the forests are disappearing by themselves. And when you look at the, the loss of winter habitat, primarily mangroves, you see a much tighter correlation. And so what may be happening is that, uh, that these population declines um, are being experienced away from uh, Arkansas and Louisiana and the Mississippi Valley, uh, Valley and across the United States, that many of these declines may actually be linked to what's going on in the wintering grounds. And so we need to figure out why that is and where they're going. Um, and that's a little bit of what I'll be talking about today. So of course, those breeding bird survey trends only begin in the 1960s. A lot of the loss of their habitat of this bottomland hardwood forest, the cypress tupelo swamp forest in the lower Mississippi alluvial valley was cleared in the late 1800s and early 1900s, well before we started counting birds. And so it's extremely likely that what we see today in terms of prothonotary warbler numbers, um, you know, they were much, much higher than even when we began counting them in the 1960s. So we may be seeing something more like 10% or 20% of, of what once was. Um, and of course, the, the, the trade-off to, to that loss is that this, this conversion of bottomland forest to agriculture has fueled our economic development, um, have made, you know, uh, as, you know, as the breadbasket for feeding a lot, of the, um, a lot of our population, both locally and across the United States and even across the world. Um, but we lose birds that way. And in fact, we've even seen species go completely extinct. Um, like the Backman's warbler, which I'm sure you weren't expecting me to say. Uh, you were expecting me to say the Ivoryville woodpecker, um, and that's still up for debate, I suppose. So that's a different talk. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today 
is the work that we're doing to advance the science of the prothonotary warbler and better understand their ecology, um, how we're enhancing breeding habitat through community science, and how we're restoring critical habitat that the prothonotary warbler depends on. And so I'll start off with the warbler ecology um, and some of the work that we've done to, to um, ad advance the science. And so those questions have to do with what we call migratory connectivity. So understanding where breeding populations are spending the winter. Um, we are looking into their, their variation in their diet and the, particularly the nestlings, like how, what foods the parents are bringing to their young to raise them. And then we're also beginning to uh, examine the, the, the birds uh, adjustments and resiliency to climate change. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these. I'm going to start off with the migration work. And this beautiful bird um, has been tricked into carrying a backpack. And as a researcher, one of the things that, that um, I can do is, is with, with federal and state permits, go out and catch birds. And you can see we have color bands on these birds. But this other device here is what we call a geolocator. And that has some really, really interesting data that, that can tell us where the birds come from. And so what we knew already is that birds are, are on the wintering grounds and start to arrive in the spring. They spread throughout the Southeast. Um, these data were generated using eBird and then in the fall, they, they disappear back to the tropics. And so we have a general sense of what the population of prothonotary warblers does, when they arrive, where they go, um, but we don't know much about the individual routes of individual birds. And so that's where that geolocator becomes really important. And so we were asking questions about um, where these birds spend the winter, right, in Central and South America. And those are places that are really hard to survey um, because it often looks like this. And so we don't have a lot of information about prothonotary warblers on the wintering grounds where they may be uh, limited. By, um, by habitat loss and, and changes to those, uh, those mangroves, the conversion of mangroves to other, other kinds of uses. And so what a geolocator does is it basically has these three little components to it. One is a data logger, one is a battery that powers that data logger and light sensor. The light sensor is, is basically measuring the ambient light every two minutes and is logging it into the, into the data logger along with the timestamp, the date and time. And the battery is powering that for nine to 12 months. And so that data is being stored on the back of the bird. And when that bird comes back a year later, we try to find the bird, try to recapture the bird, download the data and interp interpret it to understand latitude and longitude of where that bird has been for every single day of the year. And if you think about it, when it goes from dark to light and then light to dark, that is sunrise and sunset. And for any given latitude of the year, um, that, that day length tells, or yeah, a day length tells you the latitude. And solar noon, right, because because the sun always rises earlier in the east, gives us longitude. And so using just the ambient light level data to get a sunrise and sunset, we can basically back calculate latitude and longitude. So how does one catch a planetary world? You have to use a very de convincing decoy, basically something yellow with uh, helps to have a speaker nearby that's playing the song of a, of a male prothonotary warbler and hope that it'll come in and try to chase the intruder away. And we put up a very fine mist net that then catches the bird. We pull it out, we take a bunch of measurements, take the data and then attach the um, catch color bands to it so we can tell individuals apart because we want to know which individual is carrying the, the geolocator that we need to retrieve this, the following year. And, um, and then we attach the geolocator. So it's basically wearing this little device that weighs 0 0.5 grams, which is about 3% of the bird's body weight. Um, and the bird itself weighs about 14 grams, which is the equivalent of three pennies. So these are very, very small, very, very lightweight devices that we attach to the bird using stretch magic, which is a little stretchable cord that they wear like a, like a little fanny pack. And so here on the right, you can see the geolocator resting on the back of the bird, allowing the bird to flap and move around freely and, and live, its, live its little life. And so we first deployed geolocators at uh, Blue Bonnet Swamp Nature Center, which is in, in Baton Rouge. 
and um, attached three uh, attached geolocators to three different individual birds. One bird immediately disappeared. We think it was a young male that wasn't actually nesting at the site, and so it carried its geolocator off, and we never saw that bird again. The second bird, we didn't attach the geolocator right. It slipped off the bird and was never to be seen again. The bird was, but not the geolocator. But there was a third bird that raised its young, continued to carry its geolocator throughout the summer, and then sometime in July, it, it we stopped seeing it, it was the nesting season was over. And so then we just had to play this waiting game in the fall of 2013, hoping that that one bird would, would come back the, the following year in the spring of 2014. That was a very, very long winter, waiting anxiously for a single bird to come back carrying some really important data. And lo and behold, on March 24th of 2014, uh, one of our amazing volunteers, John Hartgrink, uh, who goes out to uh, Blue Bonnet Swamp virtually every day, hears a prothonotary warbler singing, tracks it down, takes a photograph of it, and lo and behold, it's our bird. It is the bird carrying the geolocator, and the geolocator is still attached. So we immediately dropped everything. We ran out there the next day, caught the bird, retrieved the geolocator. Uh, this is my collaborator, Jared Wolf, that, that really helped launch this project. And, uh, and this is what we learned. This bird went all the way to Columbia that winter. It left Blue Bonnet Swamp in late July, flew across the Gulf of Mexico uh, uh, in, in early August, in mid August, and then started going east through September, through October. It kept going over to Cuba, and then it spent a month in Jamaica. And then it flew across the Caribbean, where it ultimately spent the winter in northwestern Colombia. In early March, that bird started making its migratory journey back north, up through Central America, through Honduras. It made it to the Yucatan in mid-March. Um, it staged in the Yucatan for a little bit over a week and left the Yucatan Peninsula the night of March 23rd. They tended to leave at sundown flew across the Gulf of Mexico overnight and directly to Blue Bonnet Swamp where it was found singing by John Hartgrink the afternoon of March 24th, about 100 meters from its previous year's nest box. It did not make a stop along the way, or if it did, it was very, very brief. And it, it found its way 600 plus miles from the Yucatan to Blue Bonnet Swamp in Baton Rouge. Pretty remarkable for a little bird that weighs five pennies. So it was a three and a half month fall migration, a three week spring migration, traveled a minimum of 5,000 miles, visited a minimum of seven countries and made three major water crossings. That's just what one bird does, right? If you think of all of the prothonotary warblers out there making these journeys, it becomes pretty mind boggling what these birds need all along the way. The fact that they're spending so much time migrating south in the fall means that those places are probably really, really important to fuel, to rest, um, and, and to continue to survive to the next stop. And so over that winter, we formed um, this prothonotary warbler working group, a collaborative of researchers, of conservation professionals, um, with guidance and help from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, state agencies um, from Smithsonian. And we start to build um, a set of research questions and conservation goals uh, that we have continued to seek to implement uh, here 10 years later. And so what we did is, is, is started to coordinate uh, a geolocator deployment across the entire range, the breeding range of the prothonotary warbler. So we could learn whether different populations were making different routes, going to different wintering locations, and uh, so on and so forth. So you could ask questions like, do the western prothonotaries go to the western part of the wintering range, and the eastern prothonotaries go to the eastern part of the wintering range, or do they mix on the wintering grounds? And the answer to these questions has really important implications in how you spend conservation dollars. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that. So. To get to the punchline of what we basically found over those next few years, we recovered 34 geolocators from six different states, from Ohio, uh, from um, Wisconsin, from Arkansas, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Virginia, 
and 88% of them overwintered in Colombia. You can see that hot spot there in northwestern Colombia, which is the um, where most of the of the birds spent uh, that winter. Of course, you see a little bit of a swarm in east in western Venezuela and also in Panama, um, but the majority. Uh, from all of these different breeding po populations, we're going to Colombia. Colombia is where it's at for wintering for planetary warblers. We also learned about really important stopover locations in fall. So the Yucatan Peninsula, the lowlands of Honduras and Guatemala, and then Panama and Costa Rica were really important stopover locations where most individuals spent um, um, a considerable amount of time on their way south. We, you know, geolocators are only so perfect. They don't have um, as much resolution as we'd like. And so we wanted to verify those results using other methods. And so we used another method called stable isotopes, which is basically um, you can extract isotopes of carbon and hydrogen from the feathers of birds. And depending on where that bird molted that feather, it'll give you an indication of where that um, bird came from. And so there are ratios of hydrogen isotopes, of carbon isotopes, um, that, that will vary across the breeding range. And so if you were to catch birds on the wintering grounds, we know they grow their feathers on the breeding grounds and you can assign a location of, of that bird back to its breeding origin. We also had a bunch of feathers from our breeding sites that we could use as a reference database to be able to compare the wintering um, feather collection. And basically what that found is regardless of where we caught the birds in the winter, right here in Northern Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, um, they went to all different parts of the breeding range. So in other words, this demonstrated and supported the geolocator data that there was a lot of mixing of breeding populations kind of coming together uh, to winter together um, and vice versa, a single wintering location supported birds from across the breeding range. That is a very different pattern than what we see in most other migratory birds that have been studied in similar ways. This is an example of the oven bird, where Eastern oven birds wintered further east on the wintering grounds and Western oven bird populations wintered further west. We see this in Swainson's warbler. We see this in black-throated blue warbler. We see this in American red star. We see this in a variety of migratory birds. Um, that they show this, uh, what we call high connectivity um, compared to the pattern that we see in prothonotaries. Prothonotaries are actually somewhat unique in the fact that they all kind of come together into a very small area on the wintering grounds. So that's really cool. So if we're going to protect prothonotary warblers in the wintering grounds, we can pick a hot spot in, say, Columbia, and we know we're going to benefit birds from across the breeding range. Whereas if we were to benefit birds, uh, oven birds um, in, say, New England, where I'm at today, we would have to spend money to protect wintering habitat in the greater Antilles. But that wouldn't benefit birds in the western part of the, the, the range, the breeding range. So different kinds of conservation strategies depending on these migratory patterns. Okay. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about nestling diets. So this is the ability of, of, of parents to feed their young um, important food items that will help them grow. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. And so because prothonotary warblers are tied uh, very tightly with aquatic systems, um, this gives them an advantage in some ways because insects that have a stage of their life uh, that live within aquatic systems, like inside the swamp or inside a water body, those kinds of insects like dragonflies, midges, offer a higher essential fatty acid content than insects that only live in terrestrial environments. And so we were exploring that, but also exploring the regional differences um, across, again, the breeding range, and also uh, asking questions about seasonal differences. There are some really neat emerging technologies coming out that we tested with, uh, um, that we tested in this question using uh, what's called DNA metabarcoding. So you can basically take an environmental sample that has low quality DNA, like poop, like bird poop, that nestlings are pooping out. And all of that poop has the DNA of the things that they've been eating. 
And so you can amplify that DNA and then sequence it. And you get a whole bunch of different DNA barcodes from those different kinds of diet items. And then there are reference databases now where you can compare those DNA strips against the reference database and figure out what's been fed to those babies. One, are they terrestrial? Two, are they aquatic? Um, what families, what orders, are they grasshoppers? Are they mayflies, right? So we can, we, we can basically figure out what the parents are feeding young. And this is kind of what we found across the entire breeding range, Lepidoptera, which are the caterpillars, the moths, the butterflies, um, make up a huge portion of their diet, which we weren't super surprised about. Spiders were also really important. Mayflies were really important. Um, flies in general were really important um, and so on and so forth. Um, obviously the mayflies have an aquatic stage. We have odonta here, which are the dragonflies and damselflies. Those also have an aquatic stage. Many of the diptera have an aquatic stage. So we dove into that a little bit more too. And across two years, we found that um, they were shifting to the non-emergent and terrestrial insects later in the summer. So in early spring, when the birds are first arriving, um, when they're setting up their territories, those first clutches of, of baby birds are getting a lot of aquatic insects. And as these swamps start drying out over the course of the summer, the birds are shifting to terrestrial, which may mean that the, the babies that are coming out later are getting fewer of those essential fatty acids that the aquatic insects would have provided and may not be as high quality. Um, whereas those first clutches are maybe much more, um, uh, have higher fitness with, with being fed higher quality food items. Um, and so that has implications for the timing of the drying of the swamps. Is that related to climate change? Is that related to uh, hydrologic patterns that, um, that we're you know, adjusting in our, in our world? Or, you know. So this is a little bit of, of, of a new insight that we hadn't had before. Um, and so it kind of gets into this question of, of how resilient these birds might be to climate change. If these swamps are drying out faster because of a warmer climate earlier in the season, um, they may not be as successful in raising their young. But can they adjust their migration to get here earlier um, and, and still you know, take advantage of the early wet springs to, to feed their young? And so we're just starting this research. I don't have much to present yet. I'll dangle it as a little carrot for something to come back to. In a couple of years, we have a new graduate student at Ohio State University that is gonna be working on these questions. We have years and years of arrival and nesting data that they're gonna be pouring through. And they're gonna be asking questions about what drives the timing of spring arrival. Is it variation in winter habitat quality? Um, what are the trade-offs of arriving early versus late? Is there a relationship between arrival date and breeding success or nestling growth rates? Um, and then how does uh, the weather affect the adult condition and reproductive success? And I'm going to give you a little preview of that last one, right? So remember, drier is bad for babies, for, you know, just to really simplify it. Um, wetter is probably good for babies. Um, I'm going to skip that for a second. I'm going to talk about this one. So one of the things we can do to determine how fit a bird is, what kind of condition it's in, is we can basically take its weight and adjust it for its size. So if a bird is heavier for its size, it's gonna have a bigger number. If it's lighter for its size, it'll have a smaller number. Um, lighter is usually better during the breeding season. That means that you're more nimble, your food resources are more predictable, you're better at escaping predation, um, and you're spending more of your resources feeding your young. One of the things that's really important to understand in measuring bird condition is the time of day. Birds get heavier through the morning. And so this is just a graph showing that. This is minutes after sunrise. You can see a bird will gain um, about 10% of its body weight um, over the course of a morning. Um, this is a uh, prothonotary warbler. Um, these are data that we've, we've collected in Louisiana. So, um, so we have to adjust for that as we're, as we're looking at these questions about body condition. The other thing that's going on in the background are these climate patterns um, that are exerting different kinds of pressures on birds. 
Um, the one that's probably most familiar to folks is the El Nino La Nina system. Um, it's also known as the Southern Oscillation. It is one of the most important drivers of climate variation in our region. But there are two other ones that are also important. There's the North Atlantic Oscillation, and then there's one called the Pacific North American Oscillation. And they have different patterns. They exert different pressures on our climate. And when the oscillations are positive or negative phases, it will determine whether things are drier and warmer, cooler and wetter, or hotter and wetter, or you know, cooler and drier, those kinds of things. And so body condition, these birds are responding to those climate pressures through their body condition. So we can look at the variation in these monthly climate indices and look at how it explains that change in bird body condition over time. And so this is the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. So here's the positive phase on the right and negative phase on the left. It just basically means one phase is warmer, one phase is cooler. Uh, one side is warm, one side is cooler, one side is warmer, uh, wetter, one side is drier. On the y-axis, we have the body conditions. So you have heavier birds up here, lighter birds uh, down below. So basically, the birds' prothonotaries are not responding to this oscillation index, this climate index. They are, however, responding to the Pacific North American Oscillation Index. Forgot to mention, too, they also aren't responding to El Nino, La Nina. They're, they're mostly responding to this one. And what this basically does, so when birds are in better body condition, right, when they have, when they're lighter for their size, the conditions are wetter and cooler. That means you have more water. That means you have more aquatic insects. And so this climate pattern um, is starting to show up as an important variable in, in driving the condition of adult birds, how healthy they are. When um, birds are heavier, they're in drier, hotter conditions. You have less water in the environment. And so the next step to this kind of research is figuring out all of this. This is just Louisiana is figuring it across the range and then also figuring out um, um, how this climate oscillation varies in the face of climate change. Does it become stronger? Does it become weaker? You know, those kinds of things. So there's a lot of science I threw at you there. Um, these are all trying to start to tease apart some of the, the, the questions of, of how do we best invest conservation dollars in benefiting this bird. Um, and there's a way that people like yourselves, like anybody can go out there and actually help these birds at the same time. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we use this community of scientists, these community scientists to help enhance breeding habitat, to make more planetary warblers. And it's usually crazy people like this that wade out into the swamp and monitor nest boxes. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So because these are cavity nesters, like I said, they can nest almost in anything, right? Here's an old, here's a little lamp on somebody's front porch. Um, you know, they'll use PVC, old milk cartons. Um, you can put out anything to benefit these birds. What you really want to do is make sure that your nest boxes, whether these are from prothonotaries or any bird, right? Chickadees, wrens, bluebirds, make sure your, your nest boxes are predator guarded. Our activity will attract mammalian predators and snakes to those nest boxes. And if they're not predator guarded, you may actually be doing more harm than good. Um, it takes a lot more work to put out predator guarded boxes, but it's a, the reward is amazing. So in our uh, nest boxes, um, we have doubled the reproductive output than these birds normally experience in their natural cavities. So we have something like 80% nesting success versus something like 40% in a natural cavity. So we're benefiting these birds by putting out the boxes and it also allows us to do the research that we're interested in doing. One of the other things that these birds are experiencing is, is increased cowbird parasitism rates. Because we've isolated many of our forests, you have more edge and cowbirds are really good at living in open environments, but invading forests through those edges. And where there's prothonotaries nesting along those edges, 
the cowbirds will lay their eggs in the nests of those prothonotaries. They will grow up faster, bigger, and they will win. And they will be the only bird that fledges out of that nest. And so what we do with our nest boxes is we make the cavity diameter 1.25 inches. And in hundreds and hundreds, I lost track of the number now, 500, 800 nesting attempts, we've had zero, zero cowbird um, parasitism in those boxes, 1.25 inch cavity uh, diameters. And anybody can put out nest boxes, right? We've worked with school groups, we've worked with college interns, um, partners, volunteers, um, all kinds of people have helped us put out nest boxes. And, and these are places across South Louisiana where we've had active nest box monitoring sites over the last 10 years. Um, and literally, you know, hundreds and hundreds of boxes that are, that are enhancing nesting success. We've also done work with our national park system outside of New Orleans with uh, John Lafitte National Park in a program called Kiswoop, where we were teaching the interpreters at the, at the national park um, how to teach visitors about the prothonotary warblers and, and the work that we're doing to put out nest boxes and, and, and study them and protect them. Um, we've also worked with a, a Catholic Charities immigrant group um, to teach them about, you know, some of the science and, and about the cavity nesting. So there's just lots of really nice outreach that this bird like enables us to do. Um, like I mentioned, you know, we have really high nesting success, so we're, we're, we're providing a conservation service that people can be involved in. Um, so just in 2018, 145 boxes produced 311 babies at almost 80% nesting success. So, and we see that year after year. Um, these data can be easily submitted through nestwatch.org. Um, in fact, if you have any kind of nest in your yard that you're monitoring or you're tracking, um, you can report your, your findings to nestwatch.org and scientists across the country will use those data um, in their own research. And in fact, we are extracting um, data from Nestwatch for the Protonotary Warwood Project too. You can also contribute to the knowledge of prothonotaries and other birds through eBird. We talked in your chat about eBird at the beginning of this, and I know a lot of folks are using it now. It's an amazing resource for, for scientists to understand what birds are doing, how, how populations are changing. And so there's lots of ways that, you know, each of us, collect, you know, individually and collectively can help prothonotary warblers. Um, and so I'm going to sort of finish the talk talking about what we need to do and what we are doing in terms of restoring essential habitat that these birds depend on. Um, Louisiana, I'm gonna start in Louisiana just because you know that's where I've spent most of my time working, working on this bird. Um, there's a lot of really important prothonotary habitat here. And, and of course, this landscape is, is experiencing a crisis. We've lost an area about the equivalent uh, size of Delaware to open water. So the size of Delaware has disappeared from coastal Louisiana and become open water. Um, so it's about one football field every 100 minutes that we're losing. Um, and so that puts human community at risk, more vulnerable to sea level rise, more vulnerable to storms. Um, and many of our habitats are being converted from freshwater systems to saltwater systems. It's stressing our cypress tupelo swamps and so on and so forth. So there have been a lot of reasons of how we got here. Primarily, we've disconnected the Mississippi River from its delta, it's no longer allowed to overflow its banks, which built this landscape. We've disconnected it from the wetlands all the way up the Delta, all the way to Cairo, Illinois. Um, and then it's further stressed by saltwater intrusion that we've exacerbated by building shipping and navigation and oil and gas channels. Hurricanes are getting stronger. And of course you have sea level rise. So you have these multiple sort of processes all coming to a head that are causing coastal Louisiana to, to be in a, in a crisis. Um, I'm gonna focus a little bit on some of the restoration efforts going on in Moripa Swamp. Um, this was a, a swamp that was connected to the Mississippi River, um, but it was clear cut in the late 1800s and early 1900s, like many of the cypress swamps across the Southeast. That cypress wood was, was very, very valuable. That old growth cypress was, you know, had a lot of market value. Um, but it started regenerating um, not long after it was initially clear cut um, in the early 1900s. Um, but about 80 years ago, you know, in the 1920s or 1930s, 
I guess it's probably more than that, 100 years ago, it was um, disconnected from the Mississippi River through that levee system that we use to protect human communities like New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Um, this is the second largest contiguous forest in Louisiana. Um, it's an important bird area. Um, and we estimate that it supports something like two to 3% of the global population of hypometary warblers. Fortunately, much of this Maurepas swamp area has now been put into permanent conservation through donations and acquisitions since 2001. A lot of that happened because of the important bird area program. Um, a large uh, wealthy land developer who was responsible, frankly, for, for clearing um, areas of, of swamp for, for subdivisions, for various human development, um, decided instead he, he wanted to work with the Conservation Fund, with Audubon, with the Nature Conservancy, and actually work to put this land into, into conservation. So grants were written, and um, because of a lot of that work, the area of the Maurepas Swamp Wildlife Management Area owned by the state and managed by the state is doubled um, in the last 20 years. It's also more or less connected to these other adjacent water management areas. So today, most of Maurepas Swamp that surrounds Lake Maurepas is in permanent conservation. However, it still continues to be stressed because it is disconnected from the river. It is sinking, it is stagnating, it is experiencing saltwater intrusion. So there is a massive restoration project being considered called the Maurepas Swamp River Reintroduction Project at a cost of about $130 million, where literally a water control structure on the Mississippi River would be built to convey about 2,000 cubic feet per second of river water back into Maurepas Swamp. With that river water comes sediment, comes nutrients, and um, will flush out the stagnant salt water and um, revitalize the swamp. You'll start to get those flooding, drying cycles like a swamp is supposed to experience, uh, which will allow for cypress to eventually begin regenerating. So we wanted to understand before, just before this project is built what the bird populations in there are doing, um, including prothonotary warblers. And fortunately, a group of, of graduate students at Southeastern Louisiana University um, were conducting bird surveys about 20 years ago. And so we went in and repeated those bird surveys in 2019 and 20 to see how the bird population had changed. And what we did is you basically go out there in the swamp, you count your birds, we put them in these bands of distance from zero to 25 meters, 25 to 50, 100, 50 100 meters, so your data sheet starts to look like that. And then you convert that into a bunch of numbers and, um, and that allows you to analyze the data and estimate bird densities. Um, I won't get into the math of it, but basically what we found was for prothonotary warbler as one example, the bird populations in 2003 to 2005 were twice as high as when we went back and resurveyed them in 2019 and 2020. The swamp is deteriorating and prothonotaries are responding to that deterioration um, in a negative way. And so we did that, we did that math for a bunch of different species. And basically what we found is a lot of the generalists, the Carolina wrens, the Carolina chickadees, red belly woodpeckers, birds that live in almost any kind of forest, they weren't disappearing, they were doing fine in Maurepas Swamp. But the swamp specialists, the long distance migratory insectivores, prothonotary warbler, perula, yellow-throated warbler, yellow-billed cuckoo, yellow-throated vireo, had all dis disappeared by you know, 45 to 77% over just a span of 15 years, much faster than these birds are disappearing um, across the region. So something is happening in the swamp causing these birds to disappear. We know the swamp is deteriorating and we have a plan. So this has actually been a plan in the works um, for, over 20, for over two decades. The project was conceptualized through a funding program called QUIPRO, which is a state of Louisiana program that allocates about $80 million a year to coastal restoration. The Quipper program approved this project for engineering and design funding. It was included in the 2012 Louisiana Coastal Master Plan, which the state of Louisiana puts together every six years. But the project was deemed to be way too expensive for Quipra. So Quipper decided to not move forward with the project, even though they did the E&D, 
Um, it would be too expensive to build. However, we managed to keep it in the next iteration of the Louisiana Master Plan. So it still had a place mark. It still had a recognition that it was important. And then with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill funds, the Restore Council approved the use of that funding to fund this project. Um, in the fall of 2021, a draft environmental impact statement was released, which is a huge step in towards, terms of getting a big project like this forward. There was one hitch though, the Army Corps of Engineers would not use this Moripa project as a mitigation project for a levee that was being built nearby. There was a, I'm not gonna get into all the details, but basically that levee, in order for that levee project to, new, to move forward, it needed to be mitigated because it was gonna destroy wetlands. And the Army Corps said, no, the Moripa project couldn't be used as mitigation. So it was slowing both projects down by sort of making that decision simultaneously. So Audubon and a lot of our partners reached out for, you know, get our supporters to write comments to the Army Corps of Engineers for that environmental impact statement saying, yes, you need to use Moripa as mitigation for West, for that West Shore levy so that both projects could move forward quickly. And they agreed to do it they actually changed their mind and move forward with it. So it was a huge win and construction is imminent. So we're about to see a massive $130 million restoration project to revitalize one of the most important swamps um, in, in the region uh, to benefit these birds. And then, and then if uh, we're gonna go back in 15 years and count the prothonotary warblers again, and see how they recovered, so stay tuned. When I'm, even older and even grayer, we're gonna have some more data. And then the last thing I just wanna leave you with is what's going on in Colombia. There's some really cool things happening there. So as many of you know, there was a 50 year civil war that ended a few years ago. Um, it was a massive turnaround for the country, uh, creating this new opportunity of economic stability and growth that once didn't exist before. One of the positive outcomes, if there is such a thing, of a 50 year civil war is that a huge portion of that country wasn't being developed. Like there were a lot of places where people couldn't get into. Um, and so just through that, um, there was a lot of bird habitat being protected in Colombia. Today that could change. The, the, the country of Colombia could say, let's invest in development, let's tear everything down, build a lot of stuff and make a lot of money. Instead, the national government, the federal government, along with a number of partners, including Audubon, has developed a, a national strategy for the conservation of birds. This is a formal document that was um, um, just released a, a few weeks ago. It has five primary strategies, um, all centered around ecotourism and habitat protection. I'm not going to read each one of these, but um, generally speaking, uh, the, the government of Colombia has recognized that the most bird rich country in the world, its own, has inherent value for ecotourism and want to promote that uh, to benefit um, migratory birds as well as their, their endemic resident birds. It is the country with the most species that are found nowhere else in the world, and it has about 1,700 species of birds in, in its country. So it's an incredible place. Um, if you've never been to Colombia, I would so highly recommend it. The people are amazing. The food is cheap. The, it, it, it's, it's easy to get around. Um, I mean, it's the birds, right? The birds are incredible. So, so hopefully this will mean really, really good things for prothonotary warblers where 90% of our birds are spending the winter. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, I want to leave you with this one last grumpy prothonotary warbler. If we do nothing, hopefully we'll do something and, and make them not grumpy. So thank you. And here's my contact info if you want to reach out. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. It's wonderful to see science and conservation in action. So again, everyone, if you have questions, you can either put them in the chat or feel free to take yourself off of mute and ask a question at this time. We do have a couple of questions in the chat, so let me get started with that. Um, Karen asks, are they testing fecal sacs to get the DNA 
and what is being fed to the babies? I guess you kind of did answer a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly it, right? So it's the little fecal sacs that um, are nicely packaged. So we'll take those. Um, usually when you, um, so as researcher, one of the things we do is we take the babies out and we stick them on a scale to weigh them. We want to know their weights at least a couple of times during the development. And usually when you weigh them, they'll give you a, a, a poop sack, a fecal sack. So yeah, that's what we collect. We store it in ethanol. And then that, that DNA within the fecal sample gets extracted for uh, the metabar coating. And Eric sent me a pack of supplies and I'm working with the volunteers who are monitoring the Purple Martin boxes at the Little Rock Audubon Center and collecting fecal sacs when they go and look at the birds. And the neat thing about Purple Martins I learned is that if you take a chick out of the nest and put it on a piece of paper, it immediately poops, very cooperatively poops. And then you can put it right back in the nest and then I can collect that fecal sample. So yeah. So yeah, so we're, we're expanding right the, the the initial study to kind of focus in more in, in sort of this region, and we're asking questions actually about mosquito spraying. So if, if the, one of the predictions is if you spray for mosquitoes or manage the mosquitoes, then you're really reducing the entire insect population. So that would likely mean that birds have fewer types of food that they can feed their young, and so we can actually measure that. With, uh, with the fecal samples that we're collecting. And then conversely, as you add native plants back into a landscape, you'd predict that you would get more variety of insects in the fecal samples. So we're looking at that as well. And Vicki asks, how do you predator-proof a nest box? Yeah, um, if you remember a couple of the pictures, I guess I could scroll back, but... Um, there's a few different approaches. So, so one is if you have like a pole, you could like any kind of squirrel guard type thing that you would buy at Lowe's or Wild Birds Unlimited or you know an outdoor supply store would have some kind of like squirrel guard and that, that could serve as a fecal sack or <laughs> to serve yeah. as a predator guard. I got my, my mind. Um, and, but what we do in the swamp is uh, usually have some kind of post and then we would, attach a crossbar to the top of that post. And then we take um, a five gallon bucket, cut the lid off or cop, cut the top off so it has no like edges to grab onto. And then you mount with zip ties that upside down bucket onto that crossbar. So you kind of zip tie it on and then you attach the box to that bucket. So then you end up with this predator guard. And there's various kinds of like stove type baffles, and, um, similar methods there. In our other, system we use a four by four uh, wooden post and then wrap that tightly with a two foot aluminum flashing so the kind of flashing you might get at a, um, a store that would you know this is the same kind of it's like roofing flashing basically the really thin aluminum flashing you wrap it around the four by four post and a predator can't can't scramble up it it's too slick yeah the and a lot of conservation agencies use that metal flashing to put around trees to protect red cockaded woodpecker nests. Yep. Other questions? Yes. Um, so Emily and I recently saw uh, prothonotary warblers out at Bell Slough. And would so would that be a good place to put nest boxes? Would a Wildlife management area managed by the state be a good place for nest boxes? Generally, yes, right? I mean, so by putting out nest boxes, there's 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 two benefits. One I mentioned is that you can increase the, the reproductive output, you know, through predator guarded boxes. You can make more phytosphere warblers that way. But we've also, there's been other research that has been able to show that as you add nest boxes into a system, you can literally increase the local abundance. So they will nest in the, you know, like I said before, they're, they're, they're cavity limited. And so as you add nest boxes, you can get more individuals breeding in a location. So over a couple of years of one reproducing more, making more babies, and then two having more cavities, you will, you will increase the local population. So it's a good thing. It, it, like it, you know, it's important to have them maintain. So at minimum, go out once a year, take out the old material nests from last year. Uh, make sure the predator guards are, are you know, in ship shape. 
Um, you want to avoid having any branches coming in that are within four feet of the of the box because a snake could climb down the branch and then drop onto the box or a squirrel or something like that. Um, so there's a little bit of maintenance that that needs to be done. If you're interested in monitoring, I'd love to talk to you more. Um, our volunteers and our staff will monitor twice a week from you know about mid April through the beginning of July. So that becomes a pretty substantial commitment. Um, one way we've dealt with that is sort of by building small teams so that not one, one person is responsible for monitoring a site. You get three or four people that can rotate out with each other. That just takes some communication but, um, that can work well too. So, but the bottom line is yes, right? I mean, anywhere where protonotaries are breeding, if you add nest boxes that are predator guarded, um, you can potentially benefit the population. So follow-up question would be, um, is there an, I, I know they, you said that they would nest in almost anything, but um, is there an ideal nest box size and at what height uh, do the next nest box, uh, should they be placed? Yeah, no good questions. I mean, we, we put all of our nest boxes at about eye level just because that's convenient for us to monitor. Um, they could be a little bit lower. You just have to be careful of how much water that system gets. So there is a risk of flooding out your nest boxes if they're too low at some sites, um, too high, and then you can't really see in them, you can't really monitor them effectively. So eye level is a nice trade-off. Um, and then the dimensions of the box itself, uh, we, you know, the ideal is sort of the six inch wide boards. Um, the height doesn't matter so much, but maybe a little bit taller than wide. Um, they will squeeze into the four inch wide boards. It gets a little bit tight. Um, so the six inch one, six inch wide boards are a little bit better. Like I showed early in the presentation, we also use 64 ounce Tupperware containers. We actually did a side-by-side -side experiment a few years back where we had a Tupperware container basically within a few feet of a wooden box and um, something like three to two, three times they would pick the Tupperware box versus two times in the wooden box. So there was a slight preference for Tupperware. The downside to Tupperware is that it does break down over time and it's plastic, right? So there's all those kinds of trade-offs, but yeah. And, and I should say we have, we have nest box designs for a lot of this stuff um, on our website. Uh, we're doing a little bit of a revamp of the website right now, so I'm not sure how up to date that is, but hopefully by next spring that'll all be fixed. So if you go to delta.audubon.org, it'll be in there. Any other questions? You, you can contact me if you if you need as well. So, Eric, what is your next step or next goal in this research project? Yeah, from a research standpoint, we're you know really going to dive into the climate stuff, um, this climate resiliency question. Uh, so there's that, and then there's the other question around the mosquito spraying and native plant diversity. Um, so those are the two main ones right now. Um, there's, there's some side projects as well in terms of um, um, there's, so I guess the next step after that is what we call an integrated population model. So that's where you take things like nesting success, breeding productivity, adult survivorship, migratory distance, population size, population. Trip. There's all sorts of data you can put into these models and basically like kind of figure out um, where these birds are most limited in their life cycle. Is it during the migratory stage? Is it during the breeding stage, the wintering stage? What do you need to do in order to like get more birds to you know, change the trajectory? That's like maybe two or three steps down the road, um, but that's kind of where we want to head is, is being able to really focus in and say, well, if you do this, then you get this in terms of like population recovery. Versus if you do this, then you only get this in terms of population recovery. So we're not quite that prescriptive yet. We know we need more habitat and that's a good place to start. And we kind of know where we need to do it, um, but it'd be nice to be more prescriptive. Okay, well, thank you, Eric. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to share your research with us. And, and Eric and I have both worked for Audubon for many years. So he has been my colleague for many years, but I will say that one of the best parts about Audubon, Arkansas and Audubon, Louisiana, 
merging to form Audubon Delta is now I get to directly work with him on a regular basis. And it's a real treat and a real honor. I really appreciate you, man. Likewise. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. Pretty much so.